think of three when children open the shoe boxes. They're so excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. So excited. I mean, it's just been incredible. Kids are so excited. Giving them a gift, do it in Jesus' name, and that's what this is all about. Jesus loves you. It's a gospel opportunity. It's the chance for, the chance for the children to change the entire life. The word of God is spreading. The well, that, that's probably uh, letting you aware kind of way things have been going all morning this morning. It worked fine 10 minutes ago. So uh, we may not even be live streaming right now. We were having internet issues. So if you are watching this online, but definitely for those who are with us this morning, thank you so much uh, for being with us this morning to worship with us. What you were supposed to watch was an opera, a picture about Operation Christmas Child. And you would have saw videos of the times where they actually go to the locations and uh, hand out those boxes and stuff. So you're just gonna have to use your imagination about what that would have looked like, which is kind of the same thing we do whenever we do make those boxes, right? And we put those things together and we begin to pray over the children who will be receiving those boxes and the families that will be impacted and, and like to think and, and do know and by statistics and what the reports will tell us how at least for every box, seven people have been impacted for Christ for each box that we put together. That's, that's pretty good exponentially uh, work that we get to do for Christ, right? And so that said, uh, just a reminder about Operation Christmas Child, we put some boxes back there uh, this week, and so if you hadn't got them or if they're out, there's still some more over here uh, in the hallway if you didn't get some during Sunday school this morning, so we encourage you to get that. There are also some little uh, cars that go with them. Uh, they, they help you tell you kind of what to put in there and whatnot and some ideas, but there are also those uh, things that you fill out and leave in the box or tape it on top of the box to let you know if it's a boy or a girl and for what age range uh, that's the box is, is sent for. So just bring them back to the church during the week. You can bring them back to the office or on Sundays. Of course, the pew, uh, we're, we're, we've been getting a lot of them in already. So once that gets filled up, they'll get boxed up and sent. Uh, of course, reminder that we are a drop-off center this year. Beginning this year, we will be a drop-off center for, for many churches and groups and individuals. And so we're going to get a, a calendar out, so to speak, and let you guys know that we'll need some volunteers' help to help us uh, as, at certain times of each day to receive those boxes and, and pack them up and get them ready to be shipped out to go to the processing center. So um, we're excited about that. I know that over the last few months, it's just we haven't been able to do a lot of mission work, haven't been, been able to do a lot uh, that we normally would have on our calendar, especially as far as love does. So we still get to do this. Many of you have been doing stuff all year long for Operation Christmas Child, and we're excited to see what our church gets to do and how we get to be a part and come alongside those who will be sharing the gospel to, to kids, to families all across the world. Uh, just a few more announcements to keep in mind. You've seen um, the, the slideshow going. I know we have some uh, building grounds meeting next Sunday. Today, uh, during our evening worship service, we will have a short business meeting, and that is to uh, affirm uh, the report given by our nominating education committees. You can see that online on our website under the members tab. Uh, if you need that password, I'm not going to say it out loud. I won't tell you that it's bridging the gap, but that is the password. Uh, if you need to go online and see that, of course, you can see our membership directory, our financial statements, all that. I don't think we're online, so it's okay if I said that. We may be. So I'll have to edit it out later. All right. So that said, uh, that will be uh, going on at the end of our business, uh, at the end of our worship tonight. Uh, I know choir is still kicking off. Uh, they had a great meet first meeting last Sunday, and again. 4.30 this week, looking at Christmas stuff and just being able to come back together has been exciting. Uh, one of the things our church got to do this past Friday afternoon, we got to feed the football team for Richland, just a great time. Uh, we had to do that a lot different than we normally have, but we're still able to do that and still able to minister and share the Word of God with them, so we're excited to do that. Uh, but today we come and just excited to be together in God's house this morning, right? Stand with us this morning as we pray and as we begin our time to worship. Father, we come to you thanking you so much for this time, for this hour to be together, to be in your house, Father, to worship you, to praise you, Father, to thank you and to glorify your name and your name alone this morning, Father. 
Father, we begin to think about the things that have been going on this week, and sometimes we can be overwhelmed, but also we can look and see, Father, how you have blessed and you have done so much in our lives, Father, that we just oftentimes just take for granted. So, Father, we praise you for working our lives and, and blessing us and doing so much for us, Father. And I know that there's many in our congregation and in our midst this morning who have just had a rough week and had, had some tough days. And, Father, I pray that you would just be with them, give them peace, give them comfort, whatever they need, Father, that you would meet those needs this morning. But, Father, during this time, during this hour, Father, I pray that our mind's focus would just be on you and our heart's attention would be on you this morning, Father, as, you, uh, as we worship you, Father, and as, as our praise team comes and, and leads us to your throne, Father, I pray that that's where our mind goes to, Father, just worship you and praise you, Father. And as the word is presented to us this morning, Father, we be obedient to it, Father. I pray that uh, as we continue this series in spiritual warfare, the, the tools that we need, the, the things that you have already given us, Father, I pray that we use those if you've uh, called us to, Father, and I pray that you speak through our pastor. Use him, Father, this morning, Father. Lord, I just pray that whatever we do before we leave this building today, that we make things right. If that means uh, for those who are lost to come to uh, accept Jesus as Savior and Lord, and those of us who are Christians to just bow down and just to confess, Father. Father, to just uh, come back into that uh, right presence with you, Father. I pray that you would just draw us to you this morning, Father. We give this time to you and sing your son's precious and holy name we do pray. Amen. I want to encourage you to lift up your voices as we sing. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare your shame is undone in your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts 
become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the goodness of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Oh. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. Jesus' love. 
God, I want to thank you so much, Lord, for your presence in this place that is felt in such a real way. Father, thank you for the love that you just keep pouring out on us, for your grace and for your mercy, Father. We thank you. And Father, I thank you for the promises that you've never, never once broken. And Father, that you've promised as long as we are following you, accepting you as our Lord and Savior, that Father, one day, one day we'll be able to dwell with you, to be able to have close fellowship with you. But Father, for now, Lord, I pray that as your spirit is with us, and Father, I pray that we will worship you in such a real way right now, right here. And Father, as we continue to worship, as our pastor comes uh, to break the word, Father, please be with him. Father, open up our hearts and our minds to whatever it is that you want to teach us today, Father. It's in your very precious name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. If you have a Bible, take it and turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And it is great to see you. We have a great crowd. We appreciate your being here. And uh, we're well glad to have guests with us today too. Thank you so much for coming and trust the Lord's going to bless you because you've been here. We're broadcasting on some stations and uh, some places. I don't know where all that is, but uh, we're glad to welcome those at home, and uh, we're glad you're here. If you have your Bible, open to Ephesians 6. You know, we're going to think about the final piece of our armor that we put on, and take up, and use. And we're going to begin reading in verse 13. Some of you have asked me, why do these people stand from time to time? I have a conviction that uh, when the Word of God is read, they just want to honor God and honor that Word. And uh, you're always welcome to stand for the reading anytime. But the Scripture says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and highlighted for you today the topic of the sermon, and the sword of of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And we pray the Lord will bless the reading of His Word today, and uh, especially this day as we read about the sword of the Spirit. When I was young, people would always laugh at me when I would say something about the sword. Because I grew up calling it a sword. Anybody else ever been there? Look at that sword, you know? Y'all the crazy ones for calling it sword. You're just leaving out letters. What's up with that? Well, what is up with this sword? What is the sword that we're talking about? Here it is, the sword of the Spirit. And then he makes commentary about what that is for us in the use of our, our spiritual walk before God. But as we're thinking about this sword, uh, it's the first piece of armor that we found that is both offensive and defensive. You know, somebody come running at you with something in their hand and they want to come down on you and whack you over the head with it. You couldn't get that big old shield in place. You could always take that sword and stick it up there and block the blows and it became a wonderful defensive weapon. 
And uh, it's not one of those great old big broad swords that we might think about. This is a sword that was somewhere around a 12 inch blade to an 18 inch blade and it was light and it was something you could weld around in, in battle. And it, as a matter of fact, it's the same word that is used when Peter, boy, Peter got all of his guts in a row and they came to arrest Jesus. And as they're standing there, all of these soldiers and all of that, Peter draws out his sword. It's the same word right here. And you know, he was aiming for Malchus' servant's head, but he missed and he cut his ear off. That's probably what was going on. But Jesus stops him and puts that ear back and heals him. Same word. It's a small, small sword. And so don't be thinking it's one of these great old big things that um, you're going to have to, to weld around. It is something that is handy, something that is usable, something that is uh, used in an easy and direct way defensively. But then again, it's also an offensive weapon. And we've not seen that before. All of the other things that God has given to us in order to fight the battle against the devil and all of his wicked things that are going on, we've not had any offensive weapons to deal with yet until today. And so what does that say to us? It means that God is okay with you fighting. He gave you something to fight with. He does remind us that it's not good for us to fight among ourselves or to fight against people because we war not against flesh and blood, but we war against those spiritual powers of this world. But He wants us to fight. And don't be a passive Puritan Quaker that just kind of sits around and takes it. You get up and you fight. You take up your sword and you don't have to chase the devil. He's going to be around. You won't have to look hard to find him or any of his other demons. But when you do, take the sword and you can be on the offense. Now, I think you should remember that one well because these days when people say stuff like I say, I'm offensive. People are offended. And uh, hallelujah, that's a good thing. Christians ought to be offensive to this wicked, stupid, idiotic world that's going on. Just ought to offend the stew out of them. I saw just the other day, just this week, a professor who changed his whole line of coursework because one person got offended in his class. Of course, it was something serious that they were offended about. So, you know, you can kind of see it. Uh, they were offended at the Constitution of the United States. But uh, it's about time Christians start talking this word and become as offensive as we need to become as we get on the offense rather than always being on the defense. Christians, it's time to stand for something. I read three times in this passage to you as you were reading it along with me before we ever got to this place about take up the sword of the Spirit that we are to stand and stand and having stood, lest stand firm. Three times over he says, stand up. Get on the offense and move forward. That's what this uh, thing is, is all about in my mind. And it is uh, an opportunity for us to be the people of God on the offense. Now quickly let me tell you, and I can't believe it's 1033 and I'm already my second point of three. <laughs> Amen. There you go. Oh, uh, let me think about this particular point with you because it didn't take long to tell you we ain't talking about a pen knife and we're not talking about a big old broadsword. We're talking about something about machete style that we can really get out here and do some work with. 
But let me remind you that he says here that the sword is the sword of the Spirit. Oh, now we may have to talk for just a minute about what that means. Because it's not your sword. It's the sword of the Spirit. And it goes on to detail for us what that sword is. So I'm thinking this is a genitive kind of a, a statement. That means this is a possessive idea that the sword belongs to God. Man, that's even better. Amen. I mean, if I took a sword that I made, <laughs> oh boy, that'd be bad. Or you take a little $5 machete out here and go to whacking on something pretty hard, it might break. But not so the sword of the Spirit. Now I want to remind you that we're talking about Spirit with a capital S. Now who is that? Well, anytime that we see a capitalization on the word Spirit, then we have to realize we're talking about God. He says the Sword of the Spirit, capital S. And so it is the Sword of God, and in particular the, the Holy Spirit who welds that sword. Now, what does the Holy Spirit have to do with fighting battles and winning wars and all of that kind of stuff? Because we like to talk about Jesus Christ who came into this world, and we like to say, For the, thank God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, don't we, from the uh, Scriptures. And so we kind of wonder, what is it about the Spirit? Spirit who has something to do with warfare, and I'm glad you asked that question because he is all important. Now, if you'll just think in your mind with me the way that my mind thinks, do y'all think y'all are able to do that? Y'all just go crazy for a minute and think like I do. I, my thought is you go back into the book of Ephesians and you see all the way from chapter 1, verse 1, through that chapter, what has Paul said about the Holy Spirit in this book that's going to lead us to think that he would be the one who wins battles and fights in the war and is the one who wants to give us this sword? So go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. And I want to just read some of that stuff to you and think about it for just a few in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, uh, um, well, it says a lot. Y'all know chapter 1 verse 3 through verse 14 or one sentence. Wow. It's one of the most awesome sentences in all of the Scripture. So I'm going to be lifting out just phrases from that huge sentence that is found there. But he says in verse 13, in him, remember an H with a capital there would be Jesus. So in Jesus, you also trusted after you heard the word. There's another one of those words that we're going to be thinking about in a minute. The word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Well, that just kind of kicks me off thinking about the Holy Spirit right there. And though he is not directly talked about here, I have to tell you that it is impossible for you to get saved without the wooing and conviction and leadership of the Holy Spirit. Did y'all know that? You can't come to the Father except through Jesus, and you can't come to Jesus except that the Holy Spirit draws you to Him. In John chapter 3, have y'all ever read anything in John 3? Uh, 
God so loved the world. That's way over there in verse 16, though, isn't it? So before you ever get there, Jesus has already been talking to a guy, telling him about salvation, telling him about what he needs, and he says, you need to be born again. You need a new birth. Except a man, he says in John 3, he said, except a man be born again, he shall not see the kingdom of God. Born again. Wow. And he goes on to say in John chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, and down through there, he says that you must be born of water. That's that physical birth into this world. And of the Spirit. The Spirit. And so John is recording for us Jesus as he's telling us about how we get born again. And the born again experience, the new birth, takes place by the the wonders of the blood of Jesus Christ and, and faith in him. But by the power and the inworking of the Holy Spirit of God. Let me just... Remind you what he said in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. He was talking about us, and he says, In Jesus you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. The word of truth was welded by, and another word for, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, he says in Ephesians 6. Let me just cut to the chase. I don't think you can get saved without the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart. And so we could make this blanket statement. The Holy Spirit saves us. You say, wait a minute, Jesus saves me. Well, then God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, in the Father, God, in the Son, God, In the Holy Spirit, God, he just happens to be that dynamic one who uses his power to, John goes on over in chapter 16 to record for us what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will testify of Christ. And he's not going to speak about anything except Jesus So, let me just tell you, the the Word comes to you, you exercise faith, and it all happens by the instrumentality, the, the moving and the wooing of the Holy Spirit. We're saved by the Holy Spirit. But Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 also goes on to say that we're not only saved, we are sealed. He said, in whom also, having believed and been saved, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, sealed. How in the world, have you ever thought about this? How in the world is it that demons and the devil know who to jump on? Y'all thought about that? I mean, is he jumping on you? Are they jumping your way? Are they, you know, or do they sit back and look and watch for a little while? Yeah, they're a Christian. At least they, they say they are. I, I'm going to jump on them. Because that's the enemy. That's not it, folks. If we could see into the spirit realm, you'd see that Malcolm Pinion is a marked man. I'm branded. Y'all got tattoos? I got brands on me. You think a tattoo hurt? (laughs) No, it didn't hurt. It's the best thing in the world that's ever happened to me. I am a marked man. When the devil or any of his devils come along, any demons come along and they look at me, automatically they say, he's a Christian. Not by my works, not by the words that I say, not by the testimony of my witness or any of that. But I got a seal on me. I've got a mark on me, and it is done by the Holy Spirit. You see, when they're looking at me, they're seeing me, but they're also seeing the one who lives inside of me, indwelt by the Holy Spirit as well. 
We're sealed. And so you are, first of all, marked and branded, and the devil knows exactly whose you are. But guess what? That seal is also eternal and permanent. He goes on to say that he, the Holy Spirit, not only seals us, but that seal is our guarantee of our inheritance. Means he, he guaranteed. Who guarantees you're going to stay saved? Well, the finished work of Christ at Calvary, now the honor of the Father, more than that, the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Y'all got that? But there's one other thing in Ephesians that I really need to move to quickly because I'm getting bogged down, aren't I? I know that because a few start to fall asleep when I wake up! You know, <laughs> now that's the way you're supposed to sing that song we sang a while ago when it says it just makes me want to shout. <laughs> Wake up, folks. Y'all are not going to doze off again, are you? <laughs> y'all know I love y'all. Let me look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. Not only are we saved by the work and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that points us to the finished work of Christ at Calvary, and we're also sealed by the Holy Spirit, which guarantees us to continue to be saved, to continue to believe, continue to have eternal life. But then thirdly, here's what this has to do with warfare. He says that God would grant you, according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit. Strengthened with might through His Spirit. And so where is it that I as a Christian or you as a Christian find our strength and power in order to go against in an offensive way to go against the devil and his demons? It is by the power of the Holy Spirit of God who strengthens us. Now you are either a strong Christian or a weak Christian according to the filling of the Spirit of God in your life. All of you as a Christian are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. All of us. Or you're not saved. But then he says, be ye being filled with the Spirit of God. Paul's the one that says that in the book of Ephesians is the one that records it for us. Be filled with the Spirit. Why? Because that's where the strength comes from. Be strengthened by the power of of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. Now, how's that going to work? Well, he just happens to have a sword that he's going to loan you. That offensive weapon, it belongs to him. Who knows better how to use that sword than the Holy Spirit? And so, if we could just learn to let our arm be a channel of the working of the indwelling Holy Spirit who would weld that sword for us. Boy, wouldn't that be awesome? Well, Paul is saying that's exactly what we need to be doing. Our strength comes from the Holy Spirit of God. And his major tool, his major weapon, according to Ephesians 6, is the Word of God. I want you to think about that strength with me for just a minute as we close. That strength. It's in the Word. He gives us that explanation back over here in Ephesians chapter 6 when he says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, let me quickly tell you that there are a couple of different words that are used for the word word and translated word into the English language. What? <laughs> well, if we could read the language, we would read in John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God. 
and the Word was with God. Wow. Then 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Right? Y'all see, y'all hear, every time we use that word, word, the English word, word, we need another word in English for word so that we can say word, word, and you'll know what I'm talking about, right? What is that? It's the logos. That's that original language, word. He is the logos. In the beginning was the logos. Hmm. Now, there's another word that is translated word right here in Ephesians that is not logos. It says, take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What is that word in the original? It's not logos. It is the word rhema. Rhema. Now, those different words are used in different places to denote different things. When we're looking at Logos in chapter 1 and verse 1 and then 14, we know that we're talking about the living Word of God who is Jesus Christ. Amen? That's who He is. He's the living Word of God. Paul is going to say on other occasions and use the word Logos, he'll say, uh, or Rhema at times, and he'll say, um, something about written word. And he'll say, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and profitable for those things. Timothy. And so there is that written word. There's the living word who is Jesus. And then there is the written word of God. We call it the Bible. Okay? Y'all still with me? Now, here we're talking about the rhema, which is a combination of the two. He's talking about us having a personal relationship with the living Logos, Jesus Christ. And knowing in our heart and in our mind and memorizing the written Logos of God, the Scripture. And then being able to use that Scripture and our personal relationship with Christ in a way that helps us to come against the forces of evil in this world and to win battles and to get on the offensive and to chase the demons away. Resist what you do. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. How do you do that? You do it with the Word of God. The Word of God. That's where our strength comes from. The Word of God. How many of you feel like y'all are just so weak when you go up against the devil and it feels like he's just always winning? Huh? Y'all better raise your hand because if if you've got it all whipped, I didn't have to preach today. (laughs) Right? You know better, right? We're all struggling. We're all feeling like we're defenseless. We're all feeling like we're weak. Why do we feel that way? It is because we have not spent the time in this book like we should have. And we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to weld this sword like we need to. Listen, this word is powerful. Have y'all ever heard anything like that before? In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, it says, The Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the, the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the hearts and the intents of the heart. Wow. It's powerful. And if you are weak in your Christian walk, and if you cannot overcome the wiles of the devil and the darts of the devil, perhaps it is because you are weak in your knowledge and understanding and comprehension of the written Word of God. It's just that simple. Because the major thing that we use to fight against the devil is the Word. Let me remind you of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. You remember that scripture? After he's been baptized by 
John the Baptist, picture of that right up there. Holy Spirit comes to dwell, descends on him, and he is driven by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil 40 days and 40 nights. Y'all remember that story? Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Now, when he goes out into the desert, the devil tempts Jesus just the same way that he tempts you and me. Do y'all know how you were tempted? Can you formulate that? Well, you could go to John, 1 John chapter 2, and you'd read over there that all the things of the world, the things that are of the world are summarized in these three ideas. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And that pretty well summarizes how we're tempted. It pretty well summarizes how the devil comes at us and attacks us in broad ways. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Jesus in Matthew chapter 4 is faced with those same temptations. The devil looks at him and says, Jesus, you've been out here for 40 days and 40 nights. I bet you hungry, man. Jesus, I want to say, said, yeah, I am. But I know he didn't say that because I know what he said. I know how he came against the devil when the devil came against him. The tempter came to him and said, If you're the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered, Let's think Ramah. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. And that is the word Ramah that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's Rhema. Jesus has got this written word settled deep in his heart because guess what? He wrote it by the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit. It's his word. It is the Spirit's sword. And when the devil came against Jesus, he spoke verbally. And that has to do with that connotation of the word rhema. It is knowing the personal living Lord Jesus Christ who is the living word. It is knowing by memory and by rote the written word of God. And then when the devil comes to attack you like he did Jesus, which he's going to do with the same temptations... He's going to come at you and and bring something up in your mind, in your heart, give you an opportunity or tempt you. And you've got to defend yourself with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How do you do that? You speak it. You say it. And that is the rhema, the spoken Word of God. It's like in the beginning God just spoke the world into existence. There's some power there. Amen? Well, there is power in you when you begin to quote Scripture to the devil. You win when you do that. When you verbally quote Scripture to the devil, you can win. Now, Jesus, well, is he going to be our example? If so, let's just all go memorize Deuteronomy. Now that's the only ones he quoted. Were three verses out of Deuteronomy. Wow, I thought Deuteronomy was a dry, old, boring book. Amen? Not so. Just three verses out of the book of Deuteronomy made the devil leave Jesus. It was not because of who Jesus was. He knew very well who he was. It was because Jesus fought him with the sword of the Spirit and won. It is not because of who you are that you win. It is because you know the Word of God and you quote the Word of God as one of His sealed servants and you exercise that strength. Now, how many of you can quote some Scripture? Don't raise your hand because we don't want to be embarrassed. 
Why in the world do you think that uh, there used to be an emphasis in churches on Bible drills? And there is no longer. Why in the world do you think the world is getting worse? It's because Christians are not quoting and speaking the Word of God like we ought to. Why aren't we speaking and quoting the Word of God in situations and circumstances in this world like we ought to? It's because we've not memorized nor do we know the Word of God. Now, if you're sitting here in this room today and you are understanding what I'm saying, and I hope you are, you got to realize this, that if you're successful in your Christian walk, it's because you've been pulling out that sword and you've been quoting Scripture. And if you are unsuccessful in your Christian walk, it's because you have left that sword in the scabbard. And a lot of people are leaving it there because they don't know the Word. So what do we do? What's practical before we leave this place? Number one, I'd say that you need to read the Bible. That old dry, boring book. Why do I need to read the Bible? Because the devil's going to kick your tail all over the place if you don't. You don't hear me? I mean, he's going to kick you right in the bottom, and he's going to slap your face and laugh at you. He's going to win. Why well, don't I want to read the Bible? You know, it's not enough just to read it. Secondly, you better study it. What, what does that say? Ooh, well, I know the words are right there. But what does that mean? I, and you study on that. And you begin to see how you could use that against the devil when he comes against you as your sword. To speak against him. And then you memorize it. You memorize that scripture. Why? So that you can quote it. Well, when do I quote it? When the devil is coming around jerking your chain. You'll know when you need to. Have y'all ever heard me tell you how God talks to me when we're having our deepest conversations? Listen, this is one of the most powerful things practically that ever happens for me. There are times when we have rapid fire conversations and God is speaking into me just boom, 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 boom. And as fast as I can formulate questions, he answers them. Here's how he does it. I'll be in an attitude of prayer and I'll ask a question and immediately a scripture that I don't even remember having Read, much less memorized, pops in my mind and in my heart. And he answers me with that scripture, and I go, Oh, yeah, well, that's easy. Why didn't I see that before? It's kind of like you never asked. And as soon as I can formulate another question, God will answer. When I'm in that mode, I'm in the spirit, and I'm asking for wisdom and asking for direction. He's doing it just like this. But there's no way that could happen if I've not been reading and studying and memorizing this book. That's how God communicates to me. I don't know how he communicates to you. But it's so fast and it's so good and it's so powerful when it's going on in my life. I've got a sneaking suspicion it's the way God likes to do it. And I commend it to you. But it's not going to happen until you read the book and you memorize key portions of the book. So that when you're listening to somebody else preach, he starts quoting scripture, you quote it right along with him in your mind, in your heart, and you can just go right, you know what's coming when you're listening to preaching. Well, listen, when you start doing that, the devil's going to know what's coming too and have to back off. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he flees from you. How do we do it? Read the Word. Study the Word. Memorize the Word. But then quote. Quote the Word. If you can't memorize but three, Jesus put the devil on the run with just three. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's what Jesus said, and the devil left him three times over. 
It is written. It is written. It is written. You'd have thought Jesus had just got up off his knees and backhanded him and knocked the crazy out of him, right? But he didn't. He could have, but he didn't. Simple quoting of the scripture. You got one of the most powerful weapons at your beck and whim that has ever existed. It's the sword of the spirit. It is the word of God spoken in power at the appropriate time. Use it. That's the whole message today. Stand on it and use it. Go home and start reading it, memorizing it to the place you can quote it. And then kick some devils around. Knock some demons back. And win some battles. That's what he's telling us here. Maybe you can't do that today. You can't weld the sword of the Spirit because you don't have the Holy Spirit living in you because you've never believed and trusted on Jesus and been saved. Please come today and receive Jesus. You don't know how? Just come on down here and I'll talk to you a little bit. I'll show you how. From what? (laughs) The book of Romans right in here. And we'll talk about it. And that spoken word can lead you to a place where you can receive Jesus. Would you come? It's your greatest need. Christians, your greatest need to win the battles is to know the word. Commit yourself to that. Maybe there's somebody here today, you're a member of another church, and you say, you know what? I feel like God wants me to be here. Under the leadership of the Spirit, you come. We'll talk about how you can become a member of the family of God here at Briar Hill. But whatever it is that God's saying, the time to do it is right now. You come. Father, thank you so much for your word. It is sharp and powerful. It's quick. It's useful. It's mighty. Oh, God, help us to understand that, to realize that that we have in our hands here today and in our hearts here today all that we ever need to overcome the powers of evil and darkness in this world. Thank you for Jesus and what he did at the cross for us that we might be saved. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us to him, testifying of him and our need for him. I pray the Holy Spirit will convict us today of our need that Jesus will meet those needs right now. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. You come on the first stanza, please. Break our hearts, oh God. Break our hearts. Break our hearts.
trust you've had a good day in the Lord's house today. And uh, the way we do things to get out of here is to be seated. So y'all can be seated just now. Uh, for our guests who are here, what we do is uh, try to escort you out the back, row by row, so that you can social distance and stay free and clear. As far as we're aware, uh, no one has caught COVID while here at Briar Hill Baptist Church. And uh, we're thankful for that. And we want to keep it that way, so be safe, okay? Love these ropes because that makes the Nash family have to sit on the front row. They've been back there escorting everybody else in and ushering, and they didn't save them a back seat. They came to the front. Thank y'all. Um, that's spitting distance right here, so y'all be careful. And uh, a couple of things I want you to be praying about, and then we're gone. Uh, Miss Lula Mae Glaze had a tough fall. She's got a brain bleed and a broken hip, and she's in ICU at St. D, and they'd love for us to be praying for her. Of course, we sure want to do, sweet, sweet lady. And then Tony Holman Sr. passed away, and uh, his service is going to be tomorrow at uh, Floral Hills over by Miss Kelly's in that cemetery. It's the graveside service tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. And uh, he was dad to Tony Jr., who was in our youth group till he got grown and gone. Uh, Susan was here. Uh, I think she and Heather Kegley were best buds way back then. That kind of give you an idea of uh, who they are. And then Dana and uh, Deborah Holman, who was here in our family. You know, that's who we're talking about. So uh, pray for all of that family and that loss. Uh, Tony's just that much older than me. And so I'd like to say a young man. Uh, he, they'll need your, your prayers. And that service is open to anybody that'd like to come. Some of those restrictions have been released a little bit and lightened uh, for outside services like that. So as many as want to come can just bring your mask with you for the family's sake, especially for Deborah's. Any word before we close? Okay, quick business meeting tonight to adopt our nominating committee report. Uh, so be sure to come for that. If you don't come, we're going to nominate you for something. <laughs> Easy. We're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed. And those in the back are going to help you to, to recede safely. And we want to encourage you to come back every opportunity that you have. We're open Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday nights. Uh, anytime you want to come, we're here, and uh, we look forward to seeing you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we're going to be dismissed with this prayer. We haven't quite kicked him into minister of announcements yet. Kevin, I'll get you to be the minister of closing prayer today.